Okay. Right, welcome, and thank you very much for everybody joining us on today's uh, webinar, which is the introduction to composite engineering through the design, analysis, and manufacturing. Very much looking forward to today's webinar. It's very much a new topic that's coming in to the IMEC's L&D training portfolio. And there's a number of co courses that are associated with this. And we'll be going through these courses in more detail um, at the end of today's webinar. Um, so way of introduction, uh, my name's Dan Sanders, and I'm gonna be the moderator for today. Uh, a little bit of background, I work for the L&D team at the IMEC -E, and our focus really as a, as a team is to provide numerous kind of learning and training opportunities for both individuals and organizations, whether it's through the design or delivery or customizing of courses and programs and delivering them in-house. Or it could be through putting on webinars such as today, which allows us and you the opportunity to have more of an insight into the kind of the subject matters and content that we cover across the IMEC -E L and D. So before I hand over to today's uh, presenter, a um, couple of housekeeping points. If any of you have any particular technical issues uh, throughout the session today, please do make a note of them into the chat box and one of our team will be on hand to help you out and maybe private message you back uh, and to try and resolve the technical issue you may have. Um, and finally, for today's webinar, there will be a, a time for some Q&A, which we'll be having at the kind of the end of the, of the webinar in the kind of the last 15 minutes. So please feel free to put your questions into the chat box throughout the session, and uh, we'll be collating these questions um, and then give us an opportunity to collate them and then put them back and present them back to the presenter in readiness for the for the Q&A time at the end. Okay, so without further ado, I'm now going to hand you over to today's presenter uh, for Miroslav Stojovic, and I'll hand you over. Okay, over to you, Miroslav. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tan Seb Miroslav, and uh, I'm your uh, presenter for today. Uh, I will uh, tell you a little bit about my background and uh, and then carry on talking about an interesting topic of uh, of composites so i've spent my years in uh, a variety of uh, regulated industries and uh, uh, catering also for research and development uh, and also looking into uh, composite development life cycle manufacturing and uh, uh, research and, and, and R&D. So hopefully I'll be able to give, give you a bit of a background of why composites are so interesting, important, and uh, uh, useful in a variety of uh, engineering uh, uh, applications. Uh, so without further ado, I will uh, uh, introduce the, the today's presentation. Uh, we'll start from looking at the history uh, of composites and uh, where, the, where the origins of composite materials and thought of composite materials come from. Uh, we'll explain some uh, basic uh, definitions that are commonly used across engineering and manufacturing in uh, uh, composite world. We'll touch upon designing or how to design with composites once we have learned some of the definitions and, and what composites are. And uh, uh, we'll be talking about uh, uh, how to manage uh, parts, assemblies, and uh, some, some key assumptions built into, into this. And very, very importantly, we'll be talking about uh, manufacturing techniques because composites are so different to uh, other manufacturing processes that manufacturing plays such a significant role and is inseparable from uh, design development process. And we finally, uh, end with uh, summarizing the key learnings and uh, what have uh, uh, actually been through uh, today in this webinar. So uh, before we actually uh, start going through the presentation, I would like to ask uh, a couple of questions and uh, you can answer to the poll. Uh, first one is, do you know uh, what composites are? And it's a very simple yes, no type answer. And uh, if you do know what composites are, uh, could you please write a little description in the in the chat box, um, and we'll uh, later on reveal uh, some of the possible possibilities of what the composites uh, definitions are. So we'll give you some time to do so. 
Are we ready to publish the results? Miroslav, can you see the results there? No, I can't actually. I'll just, I'll just see. I, um, out of the yes and no's, uh, eighty-eight percent are yes and eleven percent are no. Okay, that's uh, that's fine. Uh, so, um, effectively, composites are materials that are formed by adding two existing materials to exploit their mutual benefits. And the implication is that the composite uh, material uh, can use the properties of whatever the constituent materials are built uh, built into it. Uh, so the final product is uh, actually much more improved material uh, than the two constituents to start with. Um, what this also means is that we can uh, tailor the composite to have the properties of uh, the constituent materials to cater for strength, stiffness, but also we could add uh, materials that are resistant to electricity or if need be, add material that is uh, either electrically conductive or, or electromagnetically conductive. So there is a variety of, of, of uses of how composite materials could be could be functionalized. But the key important message is that the composites are a combination of uh, two or more constituent materials to exploit the mutual benefits uh, for whatever the design, final design goal is. So uh, I said we're going to start by reviewing uh, uh, history of composites. And uh, in this slide, you can see that, that uh, we're starting very, very early. Uh, uh, human thought has used uh, uh, materials such as uh, uh, wooden sticks and uh, uh, mud to create bricks. And you can see some, some historical information. But the key thing is humans have tried to reinforce uh, basic uh, mud material with, with straws, which is effectively what composites do. The fiber in the modern composite material are actually doing exactly the same function as the uh, straw sticks in, this, in these mud bricks. They're, they're reinforcing material in particular direction, giving it strength and, and stiffness. And we can see some examples from more than 3,000 years ago of, of these uh, uh, um, ideas being tried to use by, by, uh, uh, by humans. Uh, some other examples, or rather very early examples of composites uh, include uh, uh, a concrete. Uh, concrete in itself is a composite material because it is a combination of number of, uh, of different constituents. If you then reinforce it, that further uh, strengthen up the, the composite material. So the uh, steel reinforcement acts as additional material, and therefore it is uh, also uh, classed as a composite uh, material. Um, moving on from, from these uh, developments, uh, you can see that, that, that there were some uh, also early examples of uh, using composite materials in uh, uh, developing weapons. So Mongols have used uh, uh, what is early composite by combining bamboo and uh, uh, core animal bones uh, uh, together uh, bound with the, with the resin uh, to create material which was light, stiff, and gave them properties needed for, uh, uh, for bows to uh, effectively hunt or fight. But this is all quite uh, old, and these are the materials that uh, humans could find in nature, effectively. Uh, what actually turned around the history of composites was introduction of plastics as a reinforcement material. So uh, one of the key turning points in uh, history was the uh, introduction of bakelite, uh, which was used, for example, for, for old-fashioned phones, like one presented in this, uh, in this picture. And uh, uh, that is uh, uh, effectively thermosetting resin that is, uh, uh, and thermosetting resins are one of the constituents that make the composite we'll see a little bit later. So this was one of the turning points, introduction of uh, engineering plastics that made it possible to produce plastics with the known uh, properties, uh, homogeneous materials, and uh, uh, standardized uh, uh, manufacturing process. Uh, the other component that made it possible to uh, actually make composites into engineering materials like we know today is uh, introduction of fiber. So in 1930s, uh, 
Owen Scorning developed first glass fibers. And this is, again, seen as another turning point in the development of fiber uh, reinforced plastics uh, industry. So by introduction of uh, uh, resins or thermosetting resins as, as a, a matrix material and fiber or engineering, manufacturing, uh, a commercial way of making fiber uh, into the market made it possible to make composites or start to make composites in a way that is known to uh, us uh, today. So since then, uh, composites took off uh, and uh, uh, in 70s and 80s, uh, composites were started to be used uh, more and more in, in aerospace uh, uh, sector. Although I do have to say there are examples, very early examples of, of uh, aerospace sector using composites much earlier than, than, than 70s and, and, and 80s. Uh, however, uh, it was uh, uh, only in the 90s and 2000s when the large commercial use uh, of composites in aerospace took place by introduction, introducing composites into uh, design and development of uh, uh, large aeroplanes such as uh, 787 and A350. Uh, so that's kind of a very short uh, uh, history of, of, of composite uh, thought, starting from very early ideas of reinforcing some material by having some strong and stiff fibers in particular directions. And uh, uh, that thought uh, carried through the uh, history of humankind. And it was few turning points that made it possible to have the uh, that, that uh, reinforcement material produced in a um, standardized manufacturing fashion and also the um, resin to be produced in a standard manufacturing fashion and made it possible to use composites in a way that we do now uh, in examples such as this aeroplane here on the picture. Uh, so, uh, after this very short introduction of uh, history of composites, I'll introduce some composite uh, definitions. There is loads of uh, definitions and uh, terms within the composite uh, material science, manufacturing and design. And it's very important that we know some of those so we can actually have the construction, constructive discussion and, and uh, carry out design and, uh, and manufacturing. Um, so. Let's start with the, uh, what composites are. So I mentioned before from this historical overview that a uh, composite is generally comprised of uh, uh, reinforcements, uh, which provides strength and stiffness. And in, in, in the case of these three pictures, you can see some continuous fiber, chopped fiber or particulates, which are effectively providing this uh, uh, strength and stiffness. And the matrix, which is also known as, uh, as resin, uh, that keeps those fiber together and keeps them aligned and provides a bit of sheer stiffness um, to the whole uh, composite material. So this particular webinar, although composites are really, really broad topic, you can see from the from the introduction, from the historical perspective of composites, is uh, focused on uh, uh, organic matrix composites uh, or resin matrices. Uh, and uh, also on continuous fiber. So uh, what we are typically using in engineering practice uh, for uh, uh, some high value articles are continuous fiber composites uh, and also the organics matrix uh, uh, materials, uh, resin matrices uh, combined into, into composite material. So th th this particular webinar is, is concerned with, with, with this type of material. Uh, so I, I said before that, that the composites are, are materials uh, that are formed by adding together two existing materials to actually uh, superimpose their properties and create uh, pro material whose properties are better than the uh, properties of those two materials separately. And that's uh, uh, really the definition of what composites are. And uh, uh, another definition, uh, another layer on the top of that is that the, those constituencies uh, could be uh, physically or visually identified. So they're not mixed as chemical mixtures, they're, they're rather physical mixtures, so you can still identify fiber from the, from the resin uh, materials. Uh, so the implication of this is that uh, because you have fibers that are running in a variety of directions, 
uh, and those fibers, as I mentioned, are rather stiff and strong. The composite materials can be anisotropic. And we'll talk a little bit more about this anisotropicity, which is quite the key, uh, one of the key characteristics of the of the composite materials. Um, so just to uh, remind ourselves a little bit on, on what we mean by, by anisotropic, first of all, isotropic material, typically we think of, of metals as being isotropic, so they have uniform properties in all directions. A little cube to the right shows what we mean by those directions. So in whichever direction you pull that material, it will give you very similar or the same uh, response. Uh, anisotropic material is effectively the one that has different responses in different different directions. Uh, orthotropic materials uh, has material properties that are perpendicular uh, uh, along the lines of elastic symmetry. So again, uh, it will have uh, uh, some symmetry to it. And quasi-isotropic are effectively we can make composites into quasi-isotropic material by the, the appropriate combination of plies giving this uh, effect of uh, uh, isotropicity uh, if, that is, if that is needed. But that's effectively a made-up property of the material by combining uh, non-isotropic materials in different directions. Uh, some further definitions. Um, I mentioned the fiber. When we're talking about the fiber within the uh, in the composite material, the fiber itself is a really, really thin, single homogeneous strand of material, and fiber in itself is uh, quite weak. That's why we typically use uh, filaments, which are uh, sorry, that's why we typically use yarns or, or toes. Uh, filaments are effectively fibers of extreme length. And the reason why we're using yarns and toes is because we're bundling the fiber. So if you pull out the fiber or what you see as a fiber from the composite material, you're very likely to pull yarn or a toe. So yarn is a bundle of filaments which are at micro uh, scale, uh, bundled together, um, and then uh, uh, they're suitable for weaving a fabric. And they're also twisted. And the reason why it's twisted is for, uh, of course, processability, because it's much easier to process them. They're, 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 they're uh, twisted to stay together. Toe, on the other hand, is untwisted bundle of filaments. So these are the very basic terms of the, of the fibers within the composite material. OK, so now we want to bring this into a context of composite and perhaps of a single ply. Uh, so single ply is a layer of a continuous composite uh, material, which consists of fiber and the matrix. And in the picture to the left, we have described some of the key properties, key uh, characteristics of this ply. So we have a longitudinal direction that act, uh, is acting across the uh, fiber length, transfers is uh, perpendicular to the fiber direction, and the uh, direction three is through thickness uh, direction. So these are some very basic nomenclatures that uh, define uh, continuous ply. It's quite important to remember this because we'll make reference to those later on in the, in the webinar. Now, further to the definitions, uh, we talked about a uh, single ply, which is also called a lamina. Um, and the uh, number of lamina make laminae. Um, the laminae are not bonded together. However, laminate is a bonded assembly of two or more uh, lamina, and they could have different different orientations. So laminate is made out of a number of lamina or plies that are bonded together and laminate can have number of different directions and that uh, orientation of, of different directions is something that 
you designers can have ability to define depending on what you're trying to achieve. Um, monolithic refers to a structure that are, is comprising of laminates alone. So if you have a composite material that comprises of number of plies, then we refer to this as monolithic composite structure or material. Sandwich on the other side would have a number of plies of either side of what we would call a core material. So uh, it's a panel with uh, two sheets which are effectively bonded uh, to the core that sits in, in, in the middle, effectively adding to the uh, second moment of area to uh, resist bending better. So that's really what the sandwich is. Okay, so um, I mentioned some uh, basic terminology uh, starting from the uh, fiber, uh, filament, yarn, and toe, representing the key structural component of the ply. Uh, this is mixed with resin to make a continuous ply. We also mentioned that each ply has uh, their own set of directions uh, that are very useful because along the direction one uh, is dominant stiffness and strength. Uh, direction two is uh, uh, characterized by effectively uh, resin properties because what holds the ply together is the resin. And the direction number three is uh, through thickness. We also mentioned that the um, uh, laminate is made out of lamina so you can see in the picture at the bottom of this slide a number of lamina that are unconnected with their own orientations, one, two, and three. One always aligns with the fiber direction. Two always is perpendicular to the fiber direction for each of those laminas or plies. And three goes through thickness. When we bond this assembly of lamina or plies together, we get laminate and each laminate depending on uh, orientations of individual plies will have different properties depending on what we are trying to achieve so uh, one two and three are uh, coordinates typically used for lamina systems whereas x y and z's are typically uh, coordinates used for laminate system. Uh, and we generally in composite manufacturing would use simplified uh, uh, number of angles orientations for plies mentioned here as 0, 45, plus, and minus, and 90s to uh, aid easy ease of manufacture of uh, composite materials. And sometimes minus 45 is also referred as 135 degrees. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, generally we only use zeros, 45s, 135 and 90 orientations uh, because that enables ease of communication between design and manufacture. And of course, uh, aligning those uh, fiber directions on the manufacturing shop floor becomes, uh, becomes easier. Uh, further to communicate this between design and manufacture, some uh, simplified methodologies have been devised. So for example, if your laminate consists of 25% of zero degree fiber, 50% of 45 and 135 and 25 on 90, you could use a uh, nomenclature presented at the bottom to present the whole layup. With this nomenclature, you wouldn't necessarily know how the plies would be distributed in the stack. You would know that you will have 25% of zero, 50% of plus minus 45s, and another 25% of 90 degrees fiber. But this would be perhaps sufficient for some uh, structures to be manufactured or the information communicated between the design office and the manufacturing shop floor. If you are to uh, define your composite a bit further, you would need to define something that we call a stacking sequence. So. In this case, uh, you can see the picture in the middle representing each ply with a different color and uh, 
uh, weight of the of the line. Uh, so uh, what we have here is uh, a symmetric uh, stacking sequence. What it means is the along the mid plane represented by the dashed line, dashed line uh, you have effectively a mirrored picture of the top segment of the stacking uh, on the bottom. And this stacking sequence could be only represented with one side from the uh, mid plane or uh, along the line of symmetry. So you can see 45, 135, 0, and 90 in brackets followed by letter S suffix, which represents it is a symmetric um, stacking sequence. So this is another nomenclature that is sort of used in the uh, design and manufacture of composites. So um, just to reinforce the message, uh, I mentioned before the reason for uh, having fiber is to provide strength and stiffness to the lamina. And the uh, resin is used to keep those fibers together and uh, uh, to position them in the right uh, direction. Uh, unidirectional lamina, or the lamina that has a uh, fiber only in one uh, direction, has the main strength in zero direction, and that is because that fiber really acts in that direction. And then orientation of lamina within lamina uh, will uh, determine uh, the strength and stiffness of the of the whole laminate. And this is where you as a designer will have a uh, freedom to find what works best. And this is where the composites are really useful because you could then tailor each and every part of the structure to resist only what is necessary, hence reducing the load, uh, so, sorry, uh, reducing the weight and reducing the uh, material needed to support uh, the uh, operating environment. Okay, so uh, this is this was a, a sort of a very very brief uh, crash course of the uh, composite terminology, and uh, of course uh, uh, there is a lot more that needs to be learned. This is only intended to give you some indication of what the terminology and what the uh, constituents are uh, to be carrying out design. But this would be enough for now to uh, make an introduction into the topic of of design and how to approach uh, designing with, uh, with composites. Uh, so just before we start talking about designing with composites, um, I, I just want to, uh, again, reinforce the message, why do we want to design with, with composites? Uh, there are benefits, of course, uh, in using composites, and uh, uh, those benefits are mentioned in this, in this slide, uh, because composite material uh, is effectively made at the same time as when the part is being made, you can incorporate in your component a variety of features that otherwise would need to be manufactured separately and then bonded, joined, or whatever. So you could end up having minimized part count. So that's one of the benefits that could be explored or exploited if, if, if that is your design goal. You could tailor your layups for weight optimization. I mentioned that uh, you as a designer will have freedom to look at orientations of different zones and uh, reduce the weight and number of plies to only what is needed. Um, you can choose appropriate um, uh, materials and manufacturing processes to uh, bring some functionalities uh, that your composite part might uh, have. Uh, you can... Uh, um, consider a variety of, of tooling uh, routes uh, depending on the rate of production and the cost. And finally, you can uh, consider automation effectively if your part needs to be made in, in a larger, larger series. Um, so I mentioned before that uh, you could um, reduce part count uh, through careful design and uh, also weight and cost. And you can see the picture to the, bot to the top right. You have a typical uh, skin that has a variety of zones and you might notice that some zones are thicker than the others. There are some uh, rumps uh, in this uh, picture uh, represented by, by slope between a thicker and thinner zone. And the reason for this is because uh, the thicker zones are designed to react 
high load and the thinner zones are designed to react lower load because it was found that the thicker zone sees high load. And this is where you can actually reduce weight and consequently cost because of course you are using less material in particular zone. So this is how you would realize that particular uh, uh, benefit. And uh, um, your designs need to consider a variety of features because of course composites uh, react slightly differently to the environment than, than the metallic counterparts. So those ply drops will need to be designed rather carefully so that the load transfer between the, uh, those plies is uh, appropriately achieved. Um, the pad-ups and holes are another feature that will affect your uh, uh, design. And of course, you will need to be carefully designing and selecting layups and stacking sequences. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. There is not enough time in this, in this webinar to talk about all of these topics, but um, we'll mention some of the very typical design guidelines, design rules that help designers come up with some of the uh, products. So further to the uh, considerations mentioned before, designs uh, should and can consider inclusion of a integral and bonded uh, structures so that we can reduce part count. And you can see some examples here where structures are effectively singular structures. If they were made out of metal, you would need to have uh, each piece machined separately and then um, bolted together, which could be uh, heavy and uh, introduces a number of additional operations on the manufacturing shop floor. So um, in terms of creating uh, uh, laminates um, or uh, designing for uh, using composites, designers will need to uh, understand uh, load cases. They will need to understand the geometry within which they will have freedom to operate to allow for those ply drops. Uh, if there are bond, uh, bolted joints to be created, uh, distances to the edges and fasteners are quite critical and important the function of the part. So there is the whole rest of criteria that designers will need to consider in order to achieve the uh, appropriate design. Um, and finally, your design will always be a compromise of those uh, uh, criteria because if you're really uh, strongly pushing for one particular criterion, some of the other ones might be compromised. So it's a, it is an iterative process um, to effectively achieve uh, optimized and uh, uh, compromise design. So uh, one of the key things in uh, uh, designing is uh, uh, effectively achieving a balanced laminate. A balanced laminate is when you have across your stacking sequence equal and opposite side of positive and negative orientations of the ply direction. So for example, if uh, above and below your symmetry line, you have equal and opposite number of plus and minus 45 plies. Then that would be considered having a balanced uh, laminate or balanced stacking sequence. And I'll show you a little bit later what, why is that important. Another rule that uh, designers uh, typically tend to obey is symmetry. So having a uh, mirrored image of your stacking sequence above and below the line of symmetry. And uh, combined with the balanced rule, uh, you effectively avoid having internal stresses. And the logic is very simple. Uh, if your uh, laminate above the uh, line of symmetry is reacting load in particular way, and that is not mirrored below, you will have some imbalances in how load is being reacted in your structure, effectively causing uh, some of these effects. So uh, it is very interesting to see these things and I have seen them in practice when uh, designers design unbalanced or unsymmetric structure, you after the cure and the uh, demolding of the part end up having part that is effectively um, deformed uh, because of those uh, effects. So this is why typically you would tend to avoid having unbalanced and unsymmetric uh, 
structures. I do have to say that sometimes, in particular fields of engineering, these uh, designs are actually desirable and you want to perhaps utilize this for your aeroelastic tailoring, for example, where the load case and the load imposed on a structure would cause your structure to orient itself into the most optimized position. But those would be a very high end applications. For the majority of engineering applications, you would tend to design it uh, as <clears throat> symmetric and balanced. So uh, these are some uh, of, the, of the generic uh, design philosophies. Uh, there are further uh, design guidelines that I will mention here. Um, they have been invented as a best practice by, by engineers and uh, uh, started by, by NASA in, 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 in 60s. Uh, so they're sort of mentioned here and I'll, I'll talk over them. So uh, you are tending to avoid having a number of pliers in the same orientation stuck next to each other because there is nothing to react load in the opposite direction, causing some micro cracks. Uh, if you do need to change ply orientation, tend to stick with 45 degree change because that's a minimum change in the in the load path again causing some uh, or reducing the the interlaminar uh, loading uh, use 45s with a, a negative 45 symmetrically to mi minimize coupling effect that's in line with what we talked about before um, you would need to have at least some amount of of uh, any direction 0, 45, minus 45, 90, let's say 10% uh, to counter for personal ratio effects and also to counter for uh, some of the additional uncated load cases. Uh, maximum number of orientation in, in a single direction should be uh, no more than 65, although I have seen examples where this uh, rule has been compromised. But this is the design guideline that you're trying to stick to to start with. Uh, you would tend to stick to uh, plus or minus 45 degrees uh, uh, plies uh, at the surface to prevent any damage to the structure. And uh, uh, any backlink plies, uh, that's effectively zero plies, should be away from the center line because of the uh, because you want to minimize the backlink backlink effect by creating a larger uh, distance from the center line and effect the second moment of area. So you can start to see that the complexity of, of uh, designing with composites is great because we are having this huge design freedom. And just by me talking over some design rules that are created to help designers um, generate good structures, there is a huge amount of design analysis and, and it is a very iterative process. And this is where we actually start to use um, uh, some additional tools to actually analyze composites because design rules will give you probably a very good first stab at the design of the structure, but then uh, you will need to run some uh, more involved uh, uh, analysis. So in this particular course, we'll very, very briefly touch upon classical laminate analysis because it is quite an involved mathematical procedure derived to actually analyze uh, composites, uh, to analyze strengths and stiffnesses and failures of, of composites. And I will not even attempt to go through the mathematics of it now, but what it does, uh, it will uh, enable you to find uh, uh, stiffnesses and strengths and failures along uh, your composite through thickness for each ply. Um, luckily, uh, there are tools that exist out there that will help you in carrying out these analysis that are fairly involved. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, one of them uh, presented here called LAP, but also uh, many finite, modern finite element programs uh, such as Patron or, or others would have uh, effectively uh, an instance of laminate analyzer built into them to cater for the analysis of the composite materials. And they will also take care of all the ply 
lamina, laminate orientations, transformations of loads and so on. But you would need to be careful, you would need to be trained separately to actually be able to use this in an appropriate fashion. So um, ultimately, uh, you would use finite element modeling uh, tools to analyze your uh, uh, composite materials. And uh, uh, for composite materials, the material model is different to the to the metals uh, because each ply depends on orientation. So there will be a separate module in each finite element tool to actually cater for this. Um, when you're doing your design in, in, in a finite element analysis tool, all the best practices would apply anyway. You would just have ability to run your analysis um, in a bit more uh, streamlined or, or uh, easier fashion. But uh, there are some rules of what you should try to avoid, which generally do not differ from uh, using finite element analysis in any case. So you should try avoiding, avoiding um, irregular shaped elements. Uh, models should be constrained. Uh, you should check for equilibriums and so on. So effectively, basic uh, rules of building finite element analysis model would be uh, would be applicable. So when you're building your finite element model, uh, there are a number of approaches that you could apply. So there is a black metal approach, ply by ply method and using ABD matrices. And you remember from uh, the slide talking about classic laminate analysis, ABD matrices are constituents of the, of the laminate analysis. So one by one, um, the uh, black metal approach would effectively consider the whole composite material and its architecture, ply by ply, as a single slab of material with um, equivalent properties in all directions. So the software would actually calculate what is the effective properties in X, Y, and Z based on laminate. So you wouldn't be able to see the interaction between the plies or how the failure indices distribute through thickness. You would get a failure for the whole slab of uh, of material and this is a very useful methodology when you're doing uh, initial conceptual design because you don't have enough time to iterate around with number of plies but it is restricting you in actually optimizing the structure or getting the maximum out of your uh, your component uh, on the other hand ply by ply approach uh, would require uh, quite detailed input into finite element model, where you would model each ply separately and uh, input the definition of ply in terms of material and uh, orientation and the stacking sequence. And this approach would actually give you quite a bit of details of the um, behavior of your structure in terms of stiffness, strength, failure indices, interlaminar behavior and so on. And uh, uh, just to touch very briefly, because this is quite quite a deep uh, uh, topic, you could go into 2D uh, ply by ply approach, which will give you some approximation of the through thickness stresses. But if you really are worried about the through thickness behavior, then you would probably be advised to model it as a 3D solid uh, part. Of course, that comes at expense because that's quite an involved procedure. And uh, um, finally, uh, you could uh, use the ABD matrices approach. For this, uh, you would need to compute those ABD matrices by using classical laminate analysis and uh, uh, effectively plug those back into your finite element modeling tool. Uh, that will enable a rather quick turnaround of the, of the analysis. Uh, and you would probably need to do some additional analysis outside of them to transform the results into each of the of the plies, but that would be entirely entirely possible. Right. So I'll give you a very 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 brief uh, introduction of 
analysis of, of uh, composites and, and the complexity associated with the design freedom we have because we can choose material in terms of resin and fiber. We can choose uh, fiber orientations in each ply and then we can choose fiber orientations across a number of plies. And all that needs to be, all the complexity needs to be somehow analyzed. And typically we would use tools. We would use some uh, design analysis tools to do so. But that's not the only complexity of composites. Actually, manufacturing in itself is a quite complex topic. And this is where the interaction between design and manufacturer needs to happen, because otherwise you might end up with non-manufacturable part. So uh, typically, before you start manufacturing or developing a part, you need to uh, think of some criteria relevant to your particular use case, but manufacturability is one of the things you need to think about. Weight might be a criterion that you need to consider. Cost, almost certainly. Uh, the complexity of manufacture, of assembly, of perhaps even transportation sometimes because we are making rather big parts. So transportation might be a significant design criterion. Uh, and ultimately tolerance control. So how do you assemble parts and still stay within the, the prescribed tolerance level? And all of these things will need to be considered and there will be a strong interaction between design and manufacturer activity in achieving those uh, criteria. Okay, so um, how would we select the process? Well, we mentioned some criteria, of course. Um, we would need to consider, uh, for example, if you're making uh, one-off or ten-off, the number of parts will play a significant role in the choice of manufacturing process. The manufacturability, which is sometimes represented as drapeability, how does the fiber and the material drape forms around a particular profile? Um, can you save some weight? Can you form the part? Um, is automation applicable? Um, can we use, for example, welding as opposed to uh, curing uh, in case of thermoplastics? So these are all the considerations uh, one would need to make before choosing the appropriate manufacturing process. And typically, uh, conceptual design or study would be carried out with a, a selection matrix that would uh, rate pros and cons of variety of manufacturing process across different criteria to figure out which uh, manufacturing process would be the best. Another thing is, of course, uh, with some manufacturing processes, achieving particular design features might be more or less possible. So if that is important for a particular part, that might be a criteria that drives the selection of a particular manufacturing process. So um, here are some examples of uh, uh, how that might affect the, uh, the selection. Uh, so one of the uh, manufacturing process or preform uh, creation process, uh, 3D or stitch preforms, um, that are better for complex shapes than, than uh, UD prepregs. And that's quite simple because UD would actually drape uh, or form differently to uh, those complex shapes. So uh, type of material, material form, and its basic properties also affect the, the criteria for uh, selecting processes uh, because they would affect the mechanical properties, cure ply thickness, which then affects the tolerancing and uh, uh, overall design will need to be uh, considered. And finally, structural requirements will need to be considered because of course, uh, uh, composite need to be damage tolerant um, and perhaps they will need to withstand band bending loads, but sometimes impact loads. So uh, you would need to think how to integrate features inside your composite material, composite part that will enable that impact absorption. Some of the additional uh, criteria, so dimensional and surface finish requirements. So for example, if you are um, developing a part for automotive sector, surface finish is, is absolutely critical. 
uh, assembly uh, in aerospace is uh, again another very very critical uh, characteristics and the uh, size thickness shape and complexity of these parts influences the uh, the choice of manufacturing process um, I do have to remind that the compass manufacturing is is a uh, uh, still heavily manual and the uh, uh, repeatability of the part to part manufacture is uh, 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 something that needs to be particularly taken care of and therefore the selection of manufacturing process might be limited to only few processes if this is the key criteria for, for, the, for the selection. Uh, of course, there's some other criteria such as shimming, lightning strike protection, erosion protection, and so on and so on. Um, I mentioned the uh, uh, tooling. Ultimately, the tooling is a large part of the of the cost, um, and uh, one would need to consider that rather carefully because uh, if you're making only one part, you probably need to be thinking how to uh, recover that cost of tooling through making only one part. If you're making number of parts, then the tooling uh, could be recovered through a serial production, which gives you ability to think about maybe more expensive option of the for the for the tooling, um, which enables easier easier manufacture. Um, some very pragmatic and practical things might uh, uh, need to be considered: lead time required to uh, begin production or uh, or get even material uh, that might be supplied from a different uh, uh, place. Availability of machines and equipment. Uh, machines and equipment are typically used for manufacturing of products, therefore that needs to be considered. Uh, I mentioned already that number of parts plays a significant role in, in selection because, of course, that will give you ability to think about not only the process but also the tooling strategy um, and ability to recover the cost introduced. Uh, same goes for the automation of the processes. However, uh, what needs to be considered is the maturity of particular automation equipment for the given uh, part of the of the process. Uh, in terms of curing processes, uh, considerations such as is it autoclave, out of autoclave, uh, do we have the capability and how to access it will need to be also uh, considered. Uh, recycling and health and safety absolutely critical. So. Um, when we manufacture the composite part, um, you're always thinking that must be because they're, they're so significantly better than, than the metallic counterparts. But composites are good for some things. However, they have their drawbacks too. Um, they have uh, slightly different properties and behaviors. And uh, uh, one will need to be carefully considering those uh, pros and cons because uh, composites whilst they're good for particular applications, they might not be suitable for some. Um, so, for example, metal, metal have excellent structural properties along all three axes, which effectively make, makes designing with metals relatively easy. So you don't need all of those complex analytical tools to uh, cater only for the complexity introduced by, by differing orientations. Um, they're durable, recyclable, and we have been working with metals for, for quite a number, number of years. However, even though metals have those great characteristics, uh, composites um, can and do uh, fight back, and they find their, their place and, and uh, way into uh, manufacture of, uh, of uh, high-value goods. They have high strength, uh, strength and stiffness, um, low weight. They're, they could be designed to be non-sensitive to corrosion and they have a relatively good fatigue behavior. You can achieve reduction in number of parts, which in metallic counterparts is uh, uh, somewhat reduced. Uh, building complex curve shapes, achieving good surface finish, and uh, they could get very low thermal expansion, especially with, the, with carbon fiber. On the negative side, the cost could be prohibitive, so one would need to consider rather carefully uh, the cost benefit and cost analysis uh, in conjunction with design. That includes production cost, speed of manufacture. Uh, sometimes it would be difficult to control geometric tolerances, 
and uh, and that is not purely dependent on the process but also on the skill of your uh, manufacturing workforce so then uh, uh, training requirement becomes quite quite significant uh, some of the composite constituents have limited shelf life um, the material health in that sense can be affected uh, <clears throat> and uh, some of them have a, a low uh, brittleness meaning that they, they can they can actually uh, be rather um, easy to uh, introduce um, damage okay so um, I've tried in this webinar to uh, give you exposure to a variety of topics uh, considering composite introduction design manufacture um, some of the basic terminology that, that uh, is needed to uh, start the conversation. This is not the end of it. This is rather just the beginning, and I hope I managed to uh, introduce a topic in a way that is uh, uh, interesting and, and uh, might mean that you would want to pursue further interest in, in, in composites. Um, we've divided the uh, webinar into three key stages of, of the product uh, life cycle. Uh, introduced the um, guidelines that help designers design the composites even before the heavy analytics starts because they're very complex. Those design guidelines are absolutely necessary for designers to um, know how to start the initial concepts. Um, as I mentioned, these areas have a lot more depth to them and uh, um, there is more... Uh, 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 training needed effectively to understand the, the, the depth needed to design properly with uh, those uh, uh, with those materials. Finally, I, I do want to uh, stress one, one very uh, important point that is built on, on my practical experience, and that is uh, that in order to deliver a good product, all different capabilities uh, ranging from uh, uh, engineering, design, stress, manufacturing, assembly, uh, service, and so on need to work together in order to uh, meet all the requirements and uh, uh, make the very useful product. The typical example of when they don't work together is that uh, a product that is designed can simply not be manufactured because it will not get out of the mold, for example. So very, very important to take out of this uh, uh, webinar is that uh, all of these disciplines are absolutely interlinked and knowledge across the whole of the technology is necessary to deliver a good product. So that brings me to the end of this presentation. Um, and as I mentioned, if there are any uh, further uh, interests, uh, uh, IMIKI will be running some uh, further trainings on the dates uh, presented here. That's absolutely fantastic, Miroslav. Um, really appreciate your insight into all this and into sort of an introduction to this kind of uh, composites area. So um, it's really fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Um, and actually, Miroslav, I've said uh, there's been numerous questions coming in. Um, there's been a lot of engagement on the chat box between individuals, which is great to see. Questions have been put out there and, and, and questions have been answered by um, other people that are on that are that are on this webinar, so which is great to see. So, um, so I don't know if you've got time to catch your breath. I'm conscious of time for everyone here because we've, we've reached the hour. But I did did, did kind of promise we'd have some time for the Q and A. Are you okay to I fire some questions at you, Marisla? Um Absolutely, no problem at all. Okay, I'll keep I'll straight with a very simple one. And actually, a lot of people kind of responded to this. How easy or viable is it to repair composites? Um, the repair of composites is depending really, first of all, what sector we're talking about. If we are, for example, talking about aerospace repair, that is a highly regulated area, and uh, uh, one would need to consider them um, very early, almost during, well, during the design, you would need to design for your for your repairs because, of course, what you're repairing still need to maintain and, and hold the structural strength and performance as required. Um, some other areas uh, are, are of, uh, I don't know, broad goods and uh, uh, where the structural requirement isn't that uh, 
cusp high are uh, of course uh, uh, repairable and uh, um, it is a typical uh, manufacturing procedure. One will need to, of course, to consider uh, has the main structural component or main, the structure, main structural function of the part uh, uh, been um, affected. Uh, and if so, uh, probably uh, some further design work would be needed, but absolutely it is, it is possible. It is, however, highly advisable that uh, before you launch yourself into into repairing uh, composites, some assessment of uh, uh, what the component does, uh, can it restore its original uh, properties and features uh, be achieved? Um, and uh, uh, there would be particular uh, repair kits that you could you could use to to do so. But uh, it would be advisable that some assessment of the of the requirements is uh, firstly uh, made. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And just to let you know, there's some really good comments coming in from everybody thanking you for such a very uh, informative and uh, good presentation uh, from yourself, which is great. Um, another question here from um, Jonathan Harris for you. Uh, what would be an indicative upper bound temperature for the use of composites in load in a load bearing application? Well, that's a um, very uh, good question. I mean, uh, if we're talking about uh, organic matrix composites, um, let's say the <clears throat> temperatures uh, are typically, the highest temperature uh, uh, would be probably catered with the uh, thermoplastic materials such as peak and PEC uh, going, I don't know, 350, 380 degrees uh, is the melt temperature. So you probably want to go below this uh, for your structural uh, uh, component uh, in terms of uh, uh, epoxies, which are typically used, which are the thermoset uh, materials uh, are typically used in in, in aerospace. Um, uh, but yeah, depending on what what epoxy resin you would you would use, uh, the, the 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 pure temperature is I don't know 180 degrees. So you probably uh, you you want to go not higher than 120 30 degrees at at, at, at uh, any any point in time really and, and even, even lower so it will really need to be considered what material uh, you want to use um, and uh, uh, if it is a really 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 high temperature uh, extremely high temperature organic matrix composites are probably not the right uh, material choice for you you pro probably want to look into ceramic matrices and, 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 and stuff like that Oh, I was on mute. Um, okay, uh, thank you there. Thank you, Emma. Um, another question from John Hambly. Um, he asked, as we move towards net zero, are composites a good choice? And is there work going on to reduce their embodied carbon footprint? The simple answer is uh, uh, yes, there is works going on in this space. And uh, 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 we are all very conscious that uh, um, recyclability is uh, uh, is one of the things that that composites are uh, uh, needing to meet in order to uh, <clears throat> uh, be uh, environmentally friendly and 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 as suggested at net net zero. Uh, I do have to say that already by the virtue of of careful design, we are only really using uh, uh, material as and when needed. So we are tailoring the uh, material. Um, and that uh, reduces the, the effectively uh, waste. And there are certainly automation efforts that uh, enable uh, higher yield of the of the raw material and uh, uh, less energy energy wasted. But there is a lot more work needed to uh, uh, give you the full answer. And I, I would say this is the equally the answer the, the question for for the rest of the manufacturing as it is for for, for composites. I, I think I think composites are making some good. Uh, uh, efforts to uh, tackle this and the, the projects uh, certainly that I, I know of that are uh, looking at this uh, particular challenge. Okay, fantastic. Thank you again. Um, this one's come from uh, Junoad Patel. Um, a bit of a long, longer question here. How do you go about conducting tests to ensure the material had achieved its desired structural integrity or performance? And are there any considerations given to how the part performs in extremes of temperature or loads, et cetera? 
Okay, well, it's a, a rather involved question, but uh, I'll try to answer. Uh, yeah. So uh, testing is certainly one of the key things in uh, uh, making sure the composites are compliant uh, with the design goal or, or requirement. Um, I would always say this is coming from me, from a very practical uh, experience. Uh, uh, if you are designing something and you have your material properties uh, based on some uh, uh, theoretical data, that's great. Eventually, you would need to test and verify that your predictions are being uh, met in, in reality. So uh, how would you do so? Uh, you would need to uh, consider a variety of, of test methods, and there is typically um, a typical approach in composites is, is running a pyramid of, of tests uh, from the coupon level and uh, uh, going into uh, uh, feature level, uh, sub-assembly, assembly, assembly and, and so on, increasing the complexity of the of the test and uh, 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 testing uh, greater and greater components. In the pyramidal test, certainly the, the thermal exposure is one of the elements, but it's not the only one. It could be chemical, it could be uh, UV exposure uh, and, and so on. Uh, it really depends on what your component is uh, trying to achieve. So, so it would be within your design goals or requirements, um, what uh, is uh, required. So for example, 25 year life in a, a bright sunlight uh, without UV degradation. So therefore your test will certainly need to have an element that demonstrates that. And before you go into test, because these are very expensive, you will probably need to do some quite a lot of analysis because you don't necessarily want your test to fail when you've invested so much into making a part. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, should, we just got, should we do one more question? Uh, are you happy with that, Miroslav? Yeah, 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 it's fine. Yeah, excellent. Okay. So uh, this is from Daniel uh, Connell. Um, for composites that do not have a laminate structure, in brackets MMCs or CMCs, or for think composites, where laminate theory cannot be used, what is the analysis 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 method using oriented 3D FE elements and 3D failure theories? That... Right. Okay. So uh, if I understood the question, uh, in this particular webinar, we talked about um, uh, laminated composites uh, where the fiber is oriented across the particular direction, whether that's unidirectional or, or perhaps woven. Uh, the question is about composites that have uh, two constituents uh, that are either particulates or some other forms within the uh, combined with each other. Um, so, for example, um, I, 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 there, there is a variety of techniques that you could use. I, I'll, I'll give you one that, that uh, I have used. Uh, and know of there are particular tools that could model the, uh, let's say, unit cell of your material, where you would actually model the uh, reinforcing material being your particulate and uh, also your uh, your matrix being uh, uh, enveloping material. So if you're talking about metal matrix composite, it would be your, I don't know, uh, metal that envelopes the particle that is within it or number of and you would need to model it at a micro scale to get your response that response is your effective material model that you can use in designing the the overall the overall part um, of course this is a very simplified methodology because it will give you just the first uh, strength and stiff stiffness um, um, uh, approximation you would probably need to uh, have a, a, a understanding of failure between especially between the the uh, particles and the enveloping uh, uh, material for which some other theories exist it, it's a very involved uh, uh, you know uh, topic so we could probably have a completely another uh, uh, session talking about uh, failure modes for those particular materials okay lovely all right well look there, there, you know there's, there's there's always more questions but you know for these individuals that are here Hopefully this, you know, today's session, people have seen the teaser into this and actually you can see the kind of uh, subject matters around composite that we've got coming up with the courses in October and November. So for those of you that have joined us today, you know, great. You know, if you've got an interest, please do sign into the courses that are coming up and and learn more in depth to these to, to these particular areas. Um, 
So, okay, so Miroslav, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, today. Um, fantastic presentation. Feedback has, has been fantastic as well, which is really good to see people saying how engaging it's been. Um, so thank you very much. And um, yeah, um, look forward to seeing you at, at these at these events in the in in October and November. So thank you everyone. <laughs>